Hi guys, welcome back to Sir TV. I'm Rotak Pata, your Guru host. So today we have Muhammad Ali in studio, not the boxer. <laughs> um, actually, Muhammad is uh, uh, the CEO of W Wives. Um, we're going to tap on him. He is young and extremely successful with what he does. He, he does amazing work. So I want us to actually tap into him today and let's. Let's let's get to know him better. Welcome to the show, Mohammed. Hi, Nice to nice to have. You. Yeah. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for flying in. Thank you for making sure and being proactive for us to to, to tap into you today. <laughs> yeah. Um, how you doing? I've been good. Uh, I've been enjoying the the journey. So yeah, it's been a short journey, but a very interesting one. Yeah. How was your flight? Flight was short as well, so yeah, <laughs> up and down, yeah, 45 minutes or so. Mm. So came with Air Link going with Air Botswana. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, we have to support our local guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mohammed, I want us to get into a little bit of who you are before we actually, you know, um, talk about your professional journey. Who is Mohammed? Tell me who is Mohammed. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the great Mohammed Ali, the boxer. You know, so <laughs> You're named after him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's the irony. I don't think my parents knew, but he's born on the 17th of January. Mm -hmm. And so am I. Is it? Yes. Are you sure your I, parents didn't know? And they didn't know. <laughs> so I, I know when I was in uh, Moropula, one of the, the forms, I think Form 2 or something, one of my teachers came to me and said, do you know you're born on the same day and same month as the great Muhammad Ali? And I said, impossible. It can never be. Wow. And we Googled it and we saw and we were like, what? So, yeah, I think it was 14 years later, I realized that okay, I was born on the same day as him. But, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's been a, a remarkable journey. I, I was born... Uh, as I said, 17th of January, 1985, in Princess Marina Hospital here in Khabroni. Mm -hmm. So born here, brought up here. Um, I love Botswana. Botswana is the home. You know, this is the soil where you can see my blood gets uh, the calmness from, you know, yeah. and the inspiration from. Um, uh, I went to a, a Jack and Jill, if that makes any sense. Yes. That was the kindergarten. <laughs> too, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I went to Jack and Jill. Um, kindergarten and then I moved to Thornhill Primary School. Yeah. I think it gave me a huge platform to understand how to communicate and it gave me a lot of the special skills. I think besides the academic world, what was nice in Thornhill was I was exposed to a lot of sport. Mm. So I did a lot of athletics, I did a lot of cricket, I, I, any sport that was out there I wanted to partake in, softball, soccer, you name it. And I grew a, a good bunch of friends. And I think the highlight in Thornhill Primary was in Standard 7 when you leave, uh, there's a leadership award, yeah. you know. And I shared that with, with uh, Lebohang. Yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> oh, yes. by the way, we're classmates, guys. So yes, that's and Lerato <laughs> was our classmate yeah. as well. So, I mean, it was brilliant to be part of that. I, I still remember uh, one of the, the princi uh, uh, vice principals, Mr. Alistair Stewart, he yeah. was there. So he was also a good figure for, for me uh, getting to where I am now, I think. I think when he came into coaching us in cricket or athletics or soccer. And he loved cricket. He loved yeah, cricket. Yeah, like he you loved did. Yes, yeah, yes. He, 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 he instilled these three words that I still stick by today. He said, you know, it's all about discipline, determination and dedication. These mm -hmm. three Ds. And, uh, you know, it's it stuck with me for so many years. Yeah, imagine from Standard 7, guys. From Standard 7, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is, um, you know, that those foundations were the one that built you. To, because, I mean, even when you're winning the leadership, you know, awards and everything, that means you've always... Do you think leaders are born? What What's your view on sure, this one? Sure, it's difficult, hey. Um, yes and no. I think leaders, yes, are born. But I also feel that they they can be made, you know, mm. with the right attitude, with the right discipline, with the right determination, you know. Uh, and I think the attributes of a leader is good communication. Yeah. If you have good communication skills and are able to self-motivate and motivate others, definitely yeah, yeah. you can be made. And and good listener. Yes, that's also very yeah, true. Very, yeah, yeah. All right. So tell me about um, after school, you went to University of Pretoria. T tell me about your journey um, post uh, so, high school. So um, after uh, I finished my, um, we, we used to call it O-Levels or IGCSE mm. in Marapula. I did a, a year of AS levels. Mm. And then um, I always thought I would go to the UK, you know, to mm. study there or uh, be closer to cricket or some sort of sport yeah. that would give me a better opportunity. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, my father looked in the papers and found out there was a qualification called Industrial and Systems Engineering, which I had totally no idea what, <laughs> what it, it meant. was then. Yeah. yeah. So he he asked me to. 
to go to um, South Africa to apply to a few universities. So I applied to uh, Wits University. Uh, at that time, it was Rao Rand Afrikaans University, which is now called UJ, University of Johannesburg, University of Pretoria, and Swane University of Technology. Mm. So I got accepted in different elements. So I think the one that my father was really keen on was industrial and systems engineering, which I was not keen on. Yeah. And it was previously known as Pretoria Tech. So I joined Swane University of Technology first. Mm. Uh, I did my two years um, there when it comes to S1, S2, S3, S4, and I did my practical training. I think that's where my journey started. So your practical training is after your theoretical, before you get your diploma, you have to go and do some sort of training in the in the field. And I was fortunate to, to be part of the Daimler Chrysler Group, mm -hmm. where I got training in an organization called Automotive Leather Company. I had a very good mentor. He was a German guy, very strict, very disciplined. And it was nice to be under his wing. So he introduced me to the world of international standards. Yeah. And he helped me create a foundation in terms of what exactly standards are and good governance is. And then from there, I went to the nuclear industry uh, after mm. I finished um, you know, a year of, um, of training. Uh, whilst I got my diploma, I was doing my BTEC on the side. Uh, and then I went to the nuclear industry. I was doing process engineering in the nuclear industry. And then from there, when I got my BTEC, I was given the opportunity to go to University of Pretoria to pursue my honors. And that's when I went into doing my honors whilst working in the nuclear industry. And yeah, right now I've got my master's in industrial and systems engineering and busy pursuing my PhD, my doctorate in industrial and systems engineering. Yeah, okay. So that's been my journey in terms of the qualification that I've, I've taken. And in between, I've done a few courses here and there. But uh, ideally, I think having the qualification industrial and systems engineering, it's a quite a diverse qualification. It's not building or putting, you know, uh, uh, what you call bricks, you know, yes. like as people think, or dealing with high machinery. I think it's the engineering of business processes in mm. the business world, or the corporate world. Sorry, so I think that helps a lot. It helps yeah. a lot, especially now that we're going to be talking about your business yes, and, yes. and and um, how you ended up opening the business. So now you were doing your, your master's and then did you leave the, or were you doing it? you know, simultaneously as you're working? So when I, um, when I was at the nuclear uh, industry and I was doing a little bit of training in terms of what process engineering, so it was an interesting project. Um, we were using helium as a source of energy to produce electricity. It was a prototype in South Africa. Mm. So I was doing a lot of presentations of how important international standards are, governance and process engineering collaborate together. And there was a gentleman there from an organization called South African Quality Institute, which today now is known as CEDA, Small Enterprise Development Agency. And they saw uh, something in me, you know, they saw mm. me present, uh, they gave me their business card and said, look, Mohammed, you know, um, I don't think uh, the whole Pelindaba Nexa PBMR project, which was what it was called, Pebble Bed Modular Reactor, is going to last too long. So here's a card, give us a shout when you want to be able to jump careers. Mm. So I think um, I never thought much of it. I continued as is, but I do recall uh, whilst I was working there and yes, studying part time, I heard uh, the Minister of Finance at that time, uh, Trevor Manuel in South Africa, yeah. saying that they're going to be cutting the budget for the nuclear project. And that meant us, which meant yeah. obviously we were all going to have a huge impact when it comes to job cuts. So the the idea was okay where do i go so i try to look for jobs uh, you know uh, before i made that phone call but here's the thing bring a Mutswana citizen living in south africa mm. it was extremely difficult yeah. to get an interview you know forget about the credentials i had it was just so difficult to get an interview the fact that i had a study permit before and i was doing my experience uh, uh, experience or learnerships you know through that study permit it was okay but now that i'm moving away from that permit and needing a work permit to be able to establish myself it was very difficult yeah so that's when i decided to call him you know and i thought i was going for a job interview yeah that's what i thought you know so i dressed up i went I went for the job, well, thinking it was a job interview, and the gentleman, Ilya and Malembe, had, had a chat with me, and they said, uh, Mohammed, we are not here to employ you as an individual. We need you to start a, start a business up. Mm. And I was like, start a business? How no. old were you at this, at this time? I think, um, if I recall, I was around 20. Three, mm. yeah, I think twenty-three years old. I was twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-three years old. So I'm, I'm a bit confused now because yeah, I am. That's very young, 
you know, um, I was much more thin and fit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were no kids and wife. There were no kids and wife, correct. So um, I was very concerned. I was like, no, I'm a kind of person that wants to know how much money I'll get at the end of the month so I can live my life within the means that I am living in. And I was accustomed to being comfortable with having a salary. So I was very, very unsure at the age of 23 years old of what a business is all about. Yeah. And I explained this to him and they said, Mohammed, don't worry, we'll support you. You have what it takes. There's a, a niche environment of international standards ISO standards in terms of what you know and we want you to be able to come and facilitate in our organization and train the people in Africa of what you know and your experiences mm. so I said but I'm young how do I train people that are so much older they said don't worry the theoretical and the practical knowledge you have trust me they, it's much more than what people do have over 30 years of experience you'll be okay I'll be okay so he assured me yeah, that's, then, that's, a, that's an amazing leader. It's, it's, yeah, so what a it, blessing. It was, I think, uh, God, you know, my parents have uh, have prayed very well, yes, you know, I, uh, for, for me you, to be yeah, where to be I am. Yeah. So I remember him, them taking me downstairs, it was in Sunnyside, and forced me to open up a company. And that's when I was like, okay, I don't even know what to name I my know, company. Shame. So I phoned my dad uh, here in Botswana, and I asked him, dad, look, this is what's going on. I don't know what to name my company. He <laughs> said, okay, what's your vision? I said, well, maybe global, you know? Yeah. I had a big vision then. Global. I said, global. He said, yeah, global doesn't sound too nice. What about worldwide? So I'm like, worldwide is great. And then I was like, worldwide what, dad? He's like, no, put your qualification there at the end. Mm. So worldwide industrial and systems engineers. Amazing. So that's how the name came <laughs> in. And I submitted <laughs> through it that phone call through with that dad. phone call with dad. And then it got submitted. And then later on, I realized, hey, it can be an acronym, WYS. Mm. You know, and it was just a one-man show, just me. And uh Truth be told, South African Quality Institute and CEDA helped me a lot. Yeah. They gave me a lot of opportunities. Uh, my first company they asked me to train was in ArcelorMittal in Saldana Bay, a group of very highly sophisticated engineers. And they asked me to do a 10-day course, an American-based course on certified quality uh, uh, technician. It's a lot of stats, a lot of you know mm. engineering stuff. And I said, yeah, I can do this. I've read this. I've done this before. I've got the experience. Let me go. And I did it, and I did it quite well. I got really positive feedback. Mm -hmm. The people loved me in Saldana and Cape Town as young as I was. And when that positive tick came on, uh, they gave me an opportunity where there was three consultants that failed. They were training the Diplomatic Academy, yeah. where they trained diplomats in South Africa, the Department of Foreign Affairs, to become diplomats for South Africa. Mm. So now it's called DERCO, the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. So they were going through ISO 9001, and two or three other consultants prior to me had failed. So they had given me this task to say, look, this is a huge task. Can you take them over the line? So I said, yeah, sure. I'll mm -hmm. do my best. We're very challenging. Still 23. Still 23. Amazing. Um, having meetings with these diplomats, trying to explain to them what ISO is and trying to get their bind was really challenging because they've been burnt a couple of times before. Mm, uh, burnt by, by previous by trainers? By previous consultants yeah. and previous trainers. So... Um, I went in with the approach to say, I'm here to learn. I'm here to help. I will do all the admin work for you guys. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll document your policies. I'll document your process. I'll try and alleviate as much burden as possible from your shoulders and get this done. And it was the first time in my life where uh, I was given a, a timeline of six months. And it was the first time in my life I didn't meet a timeline. Mm. I was able to get it over the line in nine months. You yes. know? But what was nice was I was able to get it over the line and they were very grateful. Actually, the lady that was uh, the head of the department then is now the diplomat for South Africa in New York, mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. So Dolores, so we've actually got close ties there. So I helped them establish that. And ever since then, the confidence just, yeah, just you know grew. just grew now because you relieved yeah. them exactly what you Correct. said. I'm I'm going to make things easier Correct. for you. Correct. Although, like you're saying, you estimated six months, but it ended up being nine, nine months. months. Yes. But because you're dealing with probably grown ups who understand these things, but they're yes. already seeing that ah, you're, you're doing a good job. Yes. So, how did they handle the the the, the time lapse? Like the the nine. They were months? very nice. They didn't put any penalties. I was someone that wasn't chasing money. I think that's a at key the time, thing at the yeah. time. I, I was uh, I was more trying to build my reputation. Quality. So I wasn't invoicing for 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 time that I felt that I was not you know delivering on. Yes. So I always invoice based on deliverables. I didn't invoice based on time. I yeah. said, let me get the outputs, and then I will invoice so that they feel gratified when they are paying for an invoice. Yeah. And I think that helped a little bit when I didn't meet the timeline. Because although the timeline was not met, the sponsor, the client, were at ease to say that at least this 
a guy is going to take us over the line and is not running after the money uh, like the previous consultants yeah. were. So I think that put them a little bit at ease. So there wasn't many issues around the time. Yeah, what period. gave you that wisdom at 23 not to go after the money? And, um, and, and, just and I think it's, it's very it's important for the youngsters today. I think, um, yeah, you know, very, you, very... You, get, you get sucked in with the social media in today's time mm. to wanting to get a nice car, a nice house. And if you can't live within your means, and I come from a very humble home where my dad and my mom always, you know, if you wanted to have a sports shoe, it would take a huge effort to get that athletic shoe, mm. you know, and they instill that in me. So when I went into South Africa, I was very worried of being consumed with by looking at my friends in terms of how they were living their lives. And I was very scared to say, you know what, my parents have taken a huge sacrifice to allow me to come to South Africa. Yeah. I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to go and spend money that is unnecessary. So I had to be very grounded. I had to be very patient. And um, I, I, was, I was someone that believed in my work. I was told once by my dad, don't ever run after money. Let the money run after you. It's your dad. So that was yeah. my dad. And I think that meant a lot to me because it stuck with me. I wasn't chasing money. I was driving a normal Toyota Corolla. Mm -hmm. Are you with me, right? Uh, that took me from point A to point B. I was very happy. Mm. I wasn't dressing fancy. I wasn't going out. Fortunately, I don't drink. So, you know, there was <laughs> a lot of savings. And you were not even distracted at Varsity to, to explore, um, to... No, nothing. Not, nothing towards alcohol. Yes, I went to clubs and all of those Back things to, to experience, alcohol, but no. no alcohol, no mm. drugs. I was very into my sport. So, oh, you know, yes, so yes, I didn't want to... Je but I actually was thinking maybe uh, one day I'll go the sporting route. I was trying my best. So you don't want to jeopardize your sporting career by taking drugs or alcohol mm. and then you know when you go through a doping test because i was playing for the south africa the botswana national team cricket at yeah, that remember, time yeah. so i didn't want to jeopardize a brand i was very grounded my way my father was like you're representing a country so make sure when you're representing your country and the country's done a lot for you you don't let them down Absolutely. so with that fear in me i try to stay away from anything to do with alcohol anything to do with drugs and to try and keep me grounded and that also helped me in my career yeah um, and i think that's what's most important if if people can be patient yeah enough Patience. just be patient enough give yourself time and opportunity to put the hard work in before you bear the fruits but if you as soon as you get your first check you go and blow it you are going to be in deep trouble mm. because you're living out of your means. Out of your means, yeah. So basically what you're saying here, because um, I mean, now we're talking on the parenting aspect that even us as parents, what we instill in our kids, you know, from, from, from the on go on living within your means and this is how it actually works, like how your dad did. And also don't work for the money at the beginning, just volunteer, go and learn. So that's what I was, I was trying to figure out to 23, where did you get the wisdom of, knowing that at this time it's not it's just not about the money it's about learning it's basically also upbringing besides it's obviously the true. schools and, and and the mentors that were surrounding you as well yes. you know in, in our conversation as well I, I i know you also mentioned your dad praying for you you know yeah. your parents praying for you you know it's like such a blessing you said they, they also prayed my parents you know and the importance of us now because we are now parents praying for our children like how much it impacts them and how we also influence them um you know in in, in that trajectory of their of, of their careers and so oh this is this is such an, an interesting journey so tell me now when now uh, with the with the diplomats then what you know from the diplomats you did a great job with them um this is now why w wise is, is registered yeah it, it's running are you the only employee at this point? Yes, just me by myself. Yeah. Soul man. And, yeah. and you're the sole owner of this company. Sole well. owner of this company. And this company as well. So these guys are just contracting to you to get the job done. Correct, yes. All right. Um, amazing because they could have easily employed you. Yes, yes, they could have, yes. So that was a blessing. That was a blessing. I think also there were discussions around employment. Yeah. But here's the weird thing. I was Mutswana. So, yeah, so it wasn't easy. So it was like easy, you know. <laughs> so, so they needed to find a way. They, also, that was yeah. also a blessing in so disguise. It was a blessing in disguise. So there were offers at that time to say, come and join us. And you know, the monies were always great. And I, I would be honest with them and saying, I'm a Motswana citizen and I'm currently on a business permit right now, mm. you know. And they were very reluctant to say, yeah, you know, because in South Africa, there's this whole broad based black empowerment equity act, mm. the triple B. And if you're a foreigner, you don't even fall into that whole category of point systems. Yeah. So it was very difficult for me to get the opportunity as a job, but it was a blessing in disguise for me to continue with my business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell me now, post the diplomats, great job. You did a great job. 
how did now the business start growing? How did now you start building the business um, to continue growing and getting your team member to, to take me through that process? So what had happened was uh, now the South African Quality Institute has split into two. Mm. So the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa had created a, a non-profit called South African Quality Institute, which was sole mandate was to train and uplift people around Africa around quality standards and international standards. So I became one of their subcontractors where I would facilitate and lecture for them. Mm. And I'd be training people from Botswana, believe it or not. Mm. From, a lot of people from Botswana came there. I trained them. Amazing. You know, engineers, uh, procurement people. Yeah. So I was part of the South African Quality Institute training facilitators. And then they had an organization called CEDA, Small Enterprise Development mm. Agency, Small uh, Science and Technology Program. Mm. So this program in South Africa has three key uh, products. One is an incubation where they give you a mentor. Small companies where they don't know how to start up a business, they give you a grant. So they pay the mentor, CEDA, to go to you and guide you through your journey. Mm. The second is technology transfer fund, up to 600,000 Rand or a million Rand worth of machinery. They don't give you the cash, they buy the machinery for you mm. so that you can do go into manufacturing or you know establish yourself in manufacturing. Mm. For South Africans. For South Africans. Mm. And then the last one was implementing systems. Quality, health and safety, environmental information security, et cetera. So that's where I was fitting in. So they would go in, uh, I would go into RFP, and um, I would be given an opportunity for a period of three months on risk, by the way. Yeah. So I wouldn't get paid for three months. I would implement the projects, do all the admin work, et cetera, and then get them over the line through certification with the SABS or any other certification body. So that was what was happening as a one-man show. And what I would do is now and then I would ask a few people like, you know, on an ad hoc basis to help me and give them, you know, a little bit of money. And I was doing everything myself. I was printing uh, by the China shop, you know, printing mm. the, the files and printing the policies and procedures just with my computer. Mm. So word of mouth started going out. Okay, this guy can do things and he does them quite well and he can get you over the line. And then... Fortunately, one of my clients, I'll never forget this, his name was Ian Sandile Funeka. Ian Funeka. Mm. He just moved out of MTN uh, as a GM mm. and started his own project management business. And his business was running off out of his garage, believe it or not. Yeah. And it was just four staff and they were doing project management. And he had the foresight to implement ISO 9001 because it was a prerequisite for MTN to become a vendor. Yeah. So he got hold of me through the different channels of SACWI and CEDA, and I implemented the, the standard for him. And when I got him through certification, it was extremely gratified. And then one day at MTN, there was a huge problem. They failed the environmental audit mm -hmm. when it came to air quality, water quality, on the data centers and the switches and that they were building. So he then mentioned as the project manager to the GM of uh, MTN that there is a, a gentleman that can help. So he asked if I would be interested in coming to do a presentation at MTN on what I can do. So I was like, wow, MTN, you know, I'm just a one man show. Yeah. This is, and I'm, this is around 24, 23, mm. 24 years old. Yeah. So I said, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So I went in, I did my presentation. I still remember on that day, you know, it's all about determination. I, I didn't have a fancy car. Mm. Uh, the vehicle broke down. Right, before <laughs> on your going way on there. my way there, I <laughs> found entrepreneurship, um, be beginning of entrepreneurship. Correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. And then I didn't know how, how I was going to do this, so I phoned a friend. Mm. Uh, he was the person that was rooming with me at that time, and I said, Please, I need your vehicle. So he said, No problem. He came, he stayed with a tow truck guy with my vehicle, and I jumped in his vehicle and I drove to MTN. So, yeah, those were the kind of journeys I went and did my pitch. and. Um, he loved it. Mm. So he loved my pitch. He said, Mohammed, how much do you want uh, to do this? And I said, no, I don't want any money. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. So let me do this on risk. I'm going to be honest with you. Give me an opportunity for two weeks to six weeks to execute this work. Mm. Give me the report. Let me look through it and let me try and do this on risk. So he said, sure. You know, it's a win-win for him. Yeah. So he gave me the report. I signed an NDA. I gave me the report. And I was under the project management company working as a subcontractor. Yeah, yeah. So I looked at the report and I said, this doesn't look too difficult. It's a lot of admin work, but I think I can do this. Spoke to a lot of my professors, uh, asked them for advice, spoke to a lot of my, the small little network I had, how can you help me get this, get that, put all the policies in place, put all the procedures in place, call the legal team in. Mm. And then believe it or not, in six weeks time, when the uh, external auditors came, they passed mm. MTN. So when they heard that MTN passed this whole thing after having such a huge uh, bump in their particular journey, 
they were all asking who's the person that helped us. And then that Willem gentleman, Willem Weber said, this is Mohammed, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Mohammed. He's the one that helped. And then he told me, he says, Mohammed, you need to employ a team. Yeah. And I'm giving you an office here. I have 30 sites across the country. Mm. I need all 30 sites done. And I want your environmental standards, your health and safety, your quality, your information. I want everything, the whole package. I don't care what it costs. You need to get it done. Yeah. So that was the first time where I was like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur uh, in my early stages, I think one of the mistakes I probably made was I reached out to my friends. Mm. So I said, you know what? One of the, the, the entrepreneurial journey mistakes. Because right now, so, so you didn't get paid for that. I didn't get paid for those six weeks. Yes. For those six weeks because yeah. you wanted to show them. I wanted how to, to show. Did uh, you have any regrets there? Um, yes and no. Uh, uh, it, now, yes, today's regret because I could have built for it. But then I was too scared to ask for money for something I could not deliver. Oh, well, did you not, not sure, sure you could deliver? I was not sure I could deliver it, you know? Mm. And, uh, uh, and I looked at the cost associated. It's just my time. That's mm. required and a little bit of running around to be able to get this in place. So I didn't see much of a cost associated yes, with the six with weeks. Your skill. It mean, was just it's my just, skill yeah. and my knowledge, my ability from the training and, and the little bit of the networks I had to be able to guide me. Mm. So I felt, you know what, let me rather build confidence in myself, but more so I don't want to take money from someone and not deliver. Yeah. That was my fear. So it was, it, it was basically about you. You were Correct. trying to sort you out first and see. All right. Okay. Oh, so then um, he gave you this project to... Then you, you're mentioning your friends. Uh, the, the problem with... So I started recruiting my friends. People mm. within my, my, my circle. You know, I looked at a developer. I looked at a close friend that didn't have any debt and was looking to move away from the bank. And mm. he could do some admin work. So I hired as uh, about three friends at that time, and we said, let's go ahead and do this, right? So we were based at MTN. We had an office there, and we were subcontracted by the project management company to do this throughout the 30 uh, sites. And um, as we started developing, we were, we were doing well in the first year. In the second year, uh, we started implementing and started getting in revenue. Did you train your friends? Yes, I trained You trained them out. They, did, so, they didn't need to be engineers for them no, to No, they didn't need to be okay. engineers. I was the one making the decisions. I was the one signing off the documents. Mm. I was the one that had the full authority of things. And they were doing a lot of the admin work, mm. you know, and doing the traveling and inspections. And I had taught them what to do. They would see, they would do on-the-job training. Okay. They'd see what I'd do and go ahead doing it. And mm. then within the second year, when the revenue started generating, uh, uh, the gentleman that I... Actually, you know, um, uh, Ian uh, Funeka and another gentleman, Olu, they said, Mohammed, I think it's good now that you can maybe start off on your own, you know, mm. move away from MT. And they just gave me an advice. We were all part of the same consortium. Mm. So I went up to Willem and I said, look, I'm still here to help MTN, but I'd like to move out of this office. I want to do my master's now. I want to be closer to university. Can I move closer to university? Mm. And he said, no problem, Mohammed, as long as the deliverables have been done and you can still deliver, continue. So that's when I started the journey of looking for an office. Yeah. So I looked for an office close to the University of Pretoria in Hatfield. This is a team of three? This is just a team of three mm. now. So I, I looked at which uh, ho ho office I could perhaps get. Mm. And I finally found an office um, where uh, I decided, okay, there's also a secondary opportunity where I can invest in printing. Yeah. So there was a couple of printers that were there on second hand. This guy was from Taiwan and he was leaving yeah. and he wanted me to take over the printing as well as take over the, 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 the rental of that particular office. So mm. I said, sure, let's do this. Signed on and I started recruiting. Yeah, when you say take over the printing what do you mean so there was currently a printing job oh. uh, a printing uh, a business oh, okay. so they were uh, taking large like books uh, from students oh, who see. could not pay oh, to buy that, books and yeah. you just gotcha. copy the books and you know people that would come for tenders you know would be printing so mm. it was just these large printers and mm. they just needed to be maintained so i decided sure i'll take over that little business and whilst that business was going on, I decided to open it up into an internet cafe. Mm. So at that time, internet was a big thing. So I decided to merge it with an internet cafe. Mm. So And I wanted to call it a 24 by 7 internet cafe. Mm. So diversification. The, diversification. <laughs> so the 24 by 7 internet cafe meant there were 12-hour shifts that I'd have. Mm. I got a laptop, sorry, a desktop, and I made it look fun. Mm. I painted it in a way that, you know, the, the youth would be attracted to. 
uh, make it funky. Make it funky. So mm. that was being run. And whilst I was busy recruiting at WIs, mm. so I'm busy trying to find uh, the right people. I try to look for a marketing person, a sales person, yes. and a few more project managers that could help me with the administrative burden. Mm. And um, I hired a, 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 a lady called Mei Li. Mm. Believe it or not, she's still with me today. Oh, <laughs> this is for W or for the... For, for WIs. Yes, for yes, WIs. Yes, for WIs. Yes. I had mm. another lady called Princess. Mm. Uh, she's still with me today. Amazing. Uh, the gentleman I had for the Internet Cafe, Emmanuel, is still with me today. Amazing. Is so, this Internet Cafe still running? Uh, no, we... Yeah. we, we, we uh, the, the, the oh, actual, there's Wi-Fi now. There, so. There's <laughs> Wi-Fi, so yeah. <laughs> So they didn't, it didn't, it lasted quite well for yeah. two years. And then the guy from Taiwan came back and he wanted to take it over. So okay, I yeah. allowed him to take it back sure. over. But, uh, and I brought Emmanuel back. So we then had a small little office in, um, in, in Hatfield. Mm. And uh, we started getting the work done. And then my friends obviously started becoming a little complacent. You know, mm. um, they started realizing, okay, this guy's making a lot of money. Mm. Are you with me, right? We want to be part of this whole circle. And they were not becoming reliable. If you needed to go to a certain site, which we need to bill for, they would say they would go, but they wouldn't go, mm. you know. And unfortunately, the clients called me and said, this is what's going on. So when I confronted them, there was a lot of mistrust and where they misled me and told me, no, uh, they were there. And I went mm. back to the client to say they were not there. And then they called me and they said, Mohammed, come, here's the CCTV footage, show me where did they come. Mm. So once that mistrust and insecurity came in, I had a chat with them. And unfortunately, that's where the first difficult uh, decision as a business owner has to come in, where you have to now ask your friends to leave the business. Yes. And that was not an easy part because obviously uh, you're asking someone that's helped you start to a certain degree. And now you're asking them because of poor behavioral issues and ethical issues uh, and disciplinary issues to leave. And uh, uh, fortunately, it worked out to a way where it was amicable in a way. It tarnished the relationship a little bit, but they were able to, to leave. Mm. I was able to then say, you know what, I need to start afresh and not have family ties. Mm. And as I say that, I recruit uh, uh, this lady that I was chatting to, strange enough. Uh, I had a close friend of mine and he was uh, uh, dating a girl and he told me at that time, uh, well, I asked him, I was like, who are you dating? So here's mm. how the world's, you know, uh, it's so weird. Mm. So he showed me a picture and out of so many pictures, he showed me a picture with the cousin. Mm. So his girlfriend and the cousin. Mm. So I asked him, who's the cousin? Mm. You know, and he said, uh, oh, well, it's her cousin, you know. So he <laughs> said, why don't you, I asked him, why don't you try and see if you can get me a number? Mm, you introduced, introduced me. Introduced <laughs> me. So strange enough, I messaged her and I said hi and she didn't reply for a month or two. <laughs> And then she said, hi, who's this? And I tried to explain myself. And and she was in the market for a job. So I said, ideally, this is an opportunity for me to see her. Mm. So when she came in, I looked at her and I said, hey, you know what, this is uh, someone I really want to hire. But I had, my, my my emotions were getting the better of me at you that time. You still liked her as I well. Still Shame. Liked her. <laughs> so recruited her uh, as an office uh, uh, a, a, a admin person. And I dr got the courage to, to ask her out. Uh, she said, yes. And I'm married with uh, to her 10 years later Aww. with two kids and one on the way. Aww. So And she's been a huge pivotal point in, in my life in terms yeah. of giving me the confidence, giving me the opportunity. So we were small. Um, we started recruiting a lot of uh, university students, graduates. Yes. So I recruited graduates being close to the university to help me with my business. So now, remember, we're still lecturing. Mm. I'm still doing the lecturing. I'm still doing the small project with mm. uh, with CEDA. Mm. There's private projects that now are coming through us doing phone calls and marketing and MTN. And then mm. MTN decide for some odd reason they are now going to have to cut budget. Mm. So the whole consortium associated projects had to stop for a period of six months. And for me, six months is a huge time. Yeah. So whilst that happened, I needed to downsize. So that was the first time where I think I had about... I grew to about 15 men staff and now I needed to downsize. So I downsized to five. So with it was me, my current wife, Meili, Princess, and the guy from the Internet Cafe, Emmanuel. Yes, it was just yes, five. Yeah. So we downsized and I had to let a lot of good people go. But they also understood. There were students, they were on contract, mm. you know, so they went. And I moved closer to 
uh, my house, which is in Centurion. And Were you Pretoria. moving to, 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 to an office closer to, to an your office, house? Yes. Was it cheaper? It was much cheaper. Uh, Rental was much cheaper. So basically what you're saying is when that happens, you started downsizing literally. literally. But unfortunately, it also involved having to let go of some employees. Correct. But do you think employing students helped? Yes, it, it did. It helped, helped a lot in terms of yes. having to, to, to part. To part, yes. Yeah, it was easier them. to part ways with them. Mm. But also they were coming in at a, at, a, at a good cost. I mean, you would give mm. them what they wanted. Because they were just starting off their careers. Yeah, but they got the job done. And they got the job done. They were enthusiastic. They were driven. I never yeah. ever looked at hiring people with qualifications. You know, mm, I looked at the drive. I look at the ethics. I look at the attributes. Do of you the still person. do that? I still do that. Amazing. Today. So that so you know this this is a huge lesson. We have to highlight this because you know I remember one time I was having a commitment. I have to say this because my brother is, 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 is also an engineer and he loves, he's such an academic as well. Yes. And every time they're employing, it's we want a GPA of 4.5, you know? Yes. So, and I was saying to him one point, you, you're, you're going to lose talent. You know, you're going to miss out on the talent because yes. the GPA doesn't necessarily mean talented, right. you know, uh, and stuff. So this is a huge thing for, 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 for you to have noticed at that age, that to be honest, sometimes qualifications are not necessarily Correct. mean talent. People are can be talented. You have to just be able to see the talent and then you 100%. nurture it. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly it. Yeah. For me, it's look. Uh, what I've learned, my brother, you know, he told me that getting a degree it has it gives you the confidence that someone has the ability to learn. Mm. But it doesn't mean they can execute the work. Yeah. You need to have people with the right ethics, with the right behavior, yeah. with the right attitude. Yeah. If you get that in, they will help you. Then, then the degree will also come. Correct. You yeah, know, maybe correct. then, especially when it comes to technical skills, correct. well, technical stuff, you might then, maybe then you can then train them for 100%. those technical. But the, I did, got okay. you. Yes. Okay, let's, let's go on with the story. Yes. Sure. And then you had to downsize and then move to... Uh, Centurion. Centurion. Yes, yes. Move your office to Centurion. And, and how, how did that go? So I think... Um, what year is this now? This was... So just before I got married. So mm. this was around 2012. 2012, yeah. So 2012. Are you with me, right? Yeah. Um, and... Um, I think we are about 28. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah somewhere, yeah, somewhere there, around there. 27, yeah, so 27, 28. So... Um, um, and now I decided, okay, um, I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm mm. going to ask uh, this girl to get married. Aww. So I proposed to her 2013, August, we got married. Yeah. And our business is now very, very normal, if you want to call it. We're yeah. not making big money. We're not making small money. We're just stable. We're breaking even. Yeah. And with my committed uh, five staff, are you with me? We mm. were happy. We were coming to work and getting the job done and helping, your helping clients. the clients. Yeah. And we were very focused, you know. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, uh, after a year, MTN came back knocking on the door. They said, look, uh, we've unfortunately made a blunder. We've promised... For letting one... you go. Yes. <laughs> We've uh, we've made a, a commitment to a client on two certifications that we don't have. Mm. So we've got three months to get this thing done. Can you help us get it done? Mm. So I said, sure. So I got in, got back in, helped uh, develop those systems, information security and IT services. Yeah. Got them in, got the certification done. I, Bob's your uncle. They got certified. So now mm. MTN started having the confidence again. Mm. What happened at MTN then is that the manager that had the faith in me, he now resigned he left at mtn at mtn is, is that the time they were downsized yes. the, the time they cut the, the cost yes that's why yes. so that's the reason. so now my relationship ties are not there ah. as strong as they would be so the new people said okay fine you know this is unfortunately south africa yeah so they got their people in to take over the work that i was doing mm. So I now obviously was, I took a leap of faith when I had that project with MTN when I got back. I mm -hmm. thought they would continue with me. So I decided to get a bigger office and I had recruited another 10 more staff yeah. to be able to say, okay, let's now slowly expand. But while slowly expanding, let's try and focus on the sales side. Let's try and get more revenue in yeah. and try and get more marketing in mm -hmm. to be able to get more stable. So we went and got a new office, a bigger office for that matter. And, uh, and now you're growing back again. Now I'm growing you, back yeah, again. You're, you're growing. Yeah, growing. Yeah. Yeah. So and then they cut in MTN cut the umbilical the cord, cord again, again for for the second time. Now they cut the umbilical cord. How how long was this after they call you back? Um, about a year and a half. 
So mm. in a year and a half's time when they call me back, so in that year and a half's time, I was able to get them over the line, do some maintenance work with them. And uh, the contract now was going in for renewal, you know, mm. so they were getting me a new contract. So I obviously thought, you know, there's not many people in South Africa that can do what I'm doing. And I want to, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll get it. And they didn't give it to me. They gave it to someone totally out of the ordinary who doesn't know anything ah. or, or, of what we do. Yeah. But that's unfortunately how the world operates and that's how business is. That's how it is, yeah. But now I'm sitting with uh, a new office with rental, mm. with uh, 15 staff again. Mm. And now I'm nervous, you know. So with that being said, I started now saying, I need to get myself into a position where I'm unique. So I started looking around courses, short courses that uh, that normally not many people have in South Africa. So mm -hmm. I identify that my skill in information security, mm -hmm. no one has the qualification as a lead auditor. Yeah. So I went my and uh, during that period, I started upskilling myself, got it, getting myself the qualifications and getting myself registered. And now the nice thing is I'm the only one, I'm still the only one in Southern Africa to be a registered Satka and Urka information security auditor. It's really it's so many, many, 10 years, 10 or I mean, 12 years Correct. later. Yeah. And amazing. I think the, the stars aligned there because what happened there was the South African Bureau of Standards, mm. they were going through a tough time. Now, I had relationships with them because I had given them a lot of business. They were going through a suspension because their auditors from SANAS uh, failed them in terms of poor governance. And they mm. called upon us to help resuscitate their system. Mm. So whilst I resuscitate the system and got them back, it gave them an opportunity to say, Mohammed, can you upskill our auditors? Yeah. So that gave me an opportunity to do the hours of auditing quite quickly, mm. get the hours, get the, the requirements done, mm. which not many people have the opportunity to do, yeah. which allowed me to excel in getting this qualification mm. and getting myself registered mm. and signed off. So kind of the stars aligned for me. And I was mentoring auditors in the South African Bureau of Standards. I was training them. I was mentoring them. I was guiding them. I was helping them with the ESCOM project mm. as a contractor. So I was getting small work, uh, as it may say. So although MTN had let me go, you know, this uh, journey of now going into audits was actually something that was new. Mm. And I think uh, after two years, um, there was a client that knocked on our door uh, called uh, Goldfields, the mining house. Yeah. So this is a big company. So they got hold of me through Bureau Veritas, which is a French organization that is an auditing firm. Yeah. And they say they don't do implementation and consulting work, but mm. they know of a, a, a guy that can do this. Yeah. And they said, speak to Mohammed. So I said, sure. I went there to do a proposal. I'm now fighting against PwC, Deloitte, mm. Ernest & Young, KPMG, and there I am as a small, <laughs> you small know, guy. Small guy. <laughs> But um, I went in with the pitch and what the nice thing was is I had the two spectrums. I had exactly what happens on the back end of a certification body mm. and I had the front end of what happens in a consulting. Yeah. And all the other companies didn't have yeah. that information or yeah. knowledge. So I was able to give them a full end-to-end -end spectrum and what I promised them, which is the first thing of business when I started off, it's when I started off, the main reason why they chose me was because I was willing to alleviate the administrative burden. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I went in. Big consulting firms don't do that. Mm. They say, you pay for my time to advise you. Yeah. You do the work, we will review it. Yes. And I said, no, I'll we do will it do the work with you and for you. Mm. And Relieve they loved that. The client. Correct. The client. And they yeah. loved that. When they heard that, they said, Mohammed, let's give you the opportunity. Yeah. And that's when I started uh, implementing the systems um, in South Africa, mm. um, the, the mining operations, which then moved to the regional in Ghana, which yeah. moved to Australia and which moved to Peru. Mm. And I started developing the systems and getting them certified. They were so happy. They got a clean audit. And this was one of my biggest achievements. It was the first mining house in the world yes. to achieve an ISO 27001 certification. Amazing. With your team of 15. With a team of 15. Yeah. And you still kept the office. Still kept uh, the at office. least you didn't move back. Yeah, yeah. I still kept the office. Yeah. So you diversified. So what I'm getting here as well is that, you know, business became tough again as, yes. as, as business happens. But then you thought about it and you're like, you know what? I need to make us make, make money another way and then you make yourself diversify money let me yes. now find a way that i can make more money Correct. another stream of income that's exactly what you did that's and it exactly. worked it worked yeah, yeah. tell me you're saying you mentioned other offices peru ghana how did you grow into that now you're you know growing in, in how many how many employees do you have now i think it's close to about 65 employees we have mm -hmm. um and that's internationally mm -hmm. uh, that's excluding all the 
outsource facilitators I now uh, employ, which is more than 150. Yes, this is this is um, subcontractors. Subcontractors yeah, yeah. that we use specialists now and then for, you know, mm. uh, uh, especially when it comes to the big training yeah. uh, that we have. But, mm. you know, full-time employees, I have about 65, and these are professionals, mm. engineers, scientists, health and safety, cybersecurity, mm. IT. So there's a huge... Uh, specialist uh, uh, side of things that I've got yeah. associated with a, a big team of marketing and sales that yes, I've got yes. established. Okay. So now, how did you grow into these companies? Now you are, you are you know, fully established in South Africa. You grew to a team of 65, I guess. Um, when did the team grow from 15 to 65? How, is it just along the It's just along the So as soon as Goldfields now got us, uh, we got them over the line mm -hmm. in 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. They gave us the contract now for five years to do it down to all the mining operations. Yeah. That's a big scope. Yeah. And now with Goldfields um, coming in, I, I decided to take a lot of that money and I invested it a lot in Google. In Google. Google. Mm. So I invested a lot of that in Google AdWords, search engine optimization. Mm. I got contractors to come in and, and heighten my website to get me more visually, uh, you know, a, a visually identifiable in the virtual space. Mm. Taking the money and yes. investing it back into it. And business. I never, still, very, I'm, not, very I'm not doing anything fancy. Yeah. Are you with me, right? Yeah. Going all back into that. And then now what I realized is I'm not going to clients anymore. Mm. Clients are coming to me. Once I got the website up and running and mm. I got Google AdWords running. So now I've got a full footage sales team. And that sales team is able to now get in bigger clients. Yes. They're able to close deals on my behalf. Mm. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges I think entrepreneurs have mm. is that they don't know how to let go, when to let go to, from doing everything themselves. How to delegate. To delegate. Uh, how did you do that? I want to know now when you got the team in, how did you train them? First, yeah, take me through that process because that's exactly what is making a lot of entrepreneurs. They're the face of the business and everybody only, you know, and, and it actually does happen where own businesses only want to work with Mohammed. Yes. You know, because you, you've been doing the training and they, no, we want Mohammed to, to, to come. How did you get from not them wanting Mohammed only now to trusting your team to be able to implement without you? I think entrepreneurs need to trust uh, loyal employees. Mm. So when you identify who loyal employees are, you need to look after them. Yeah. How, how, do, you, how do you identify that? The, the length? Or the, the... I think when times are tough, they still stick with you. Uh -huh. You know, so times are tough. And times were tough for me, and they're still stuck by me. Did you reduce salaries when times were tough? Um, I didn't reduce salaries, but uh, we didn't do the fancy things. Like We didn't give them increases. I see. They weren't but, getting it was, bonuses. but it was shaky. It, it was shaky, shaky and, they, and they were nervous, but they stayed, and they yeah. believed that. Look, they were comfortable also, and they were enjoying the work they were doing. Mm. But, uh, but I looked after them. If they needed uh, a loan or if they needed some help with a wedding or a funeral, yeah or maybe helping with their school fees Leadership. for the kids, you know, and I had the ability to do so, I would definitely. Ah. So it was a kind of relationship where when they were struggling, I was still there to help them. So they they felt that, okay, he's here to help us when we, we struggle. Yeah. And I felt ah, they're here to help me when I'm struggling. Yeah. So it was a two-way thing. And I think once that relationship and that bond started coming up and the trust was there, mm. I now started understanding that I can delegate certain tasks to them mm -hmm. to be able to take more responsibility. So the one lady, she became an operational manager. Mm -hmm. I trained her and she now handles a team of about 45. Wow, Oper operational manager from what? From she was just an administrative uh -huh. lady, and That's she, her was name again? Mei Li. Mei Li, she was the Meili. Yeah. She was the girl that I one of the first girls I recruited. I remember that. Yes, yes. I wanted to say is it Meili? Yeah, yes. yes. So yes. she's handling uh, an entire team. So I've been able to upskill her. She's learned from me. Mm. She's got the qualifications, etc. And now she's got an entire team of experienced, mm. uh, hardworking employees under her so you trained her basically did you take her for for training to make sure she gets certified all this is that what you did as a business also to invest in your employees Correct. to make sure that they can actually um, be able to take over basically it was a two-way thing so yeah. she learned a lot of the skills on the job with me but mm. i also invested in her qualification mm. so i said i will pay for your qualification to mm. become a project manager yes you know i'll invest in you i'll grow you as an individual and i think she was very grateful um, for that yeah. so she was able to get the educational background and mm. backing mm. getting all the small courses as well but more so I think the skill of knowing how to negotiate how to be able to get the work done and motivate your team she mm. learned very uh. well so that helped me in terms of releasing the pressure a little bit and her taking the operations 
whilst Princess, uh, she started focusing on sales. Mm. Um, it did help that her late husband uh, was a diplomat. Mm. So he was able to open a lot of doors in terms of saying, hear this guy out, hear what he has yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. So know? those are connections. Correct. Well. So those yeah. are, it's a lot of networks. Mm. And I think she was able to work with the sales team and motivate them to generate the numbers. Yeah. And when we were struggling, she was able to call upon certain, uh, you know, clients to 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 close a deal, which would sustain us. Yeah. So now I'm trusting them, and they are now at a position just under me, building a team which they are managing, which they've never heard before. Mm. So now it's going through leadership courses, yeah. um, equipping them with the necessary management skills, yes. and I'm investing in them. Yes. And I think that's what I started doing is once I trusted the the staff that i had i delegated it mm. and they then started the whole ripple effect of trusting delegating delegating trusting the team uh -huh. right. and it starts from where the top top yeah you have it to. always starts from the top so that's basically how the existing ones that were loyal then yes. you make sure you reward them Correct. by capacitating them for them to be able to lead and also i like the fact that I, I, my, my, my next question was going to be did you capacitate them for leadership as well? Because you know you can capacitate somebody on the skill yes. of, of implementing the project and implementing um, you know, the, the various standards. Like ISO. But what about the leadership aspect? Now tell me, have you ever experienced where you, know, um, you have capacitated this, this, um, this employee, this team member, but leadership, they're still struggling? Um, yes. How did you deal with those kind of it, dynamics? It still is a difficult thing. The yeah. reason is people are, uh, are not very easy to deal with. They're mm. very difficult. Uh, remember, I'm not selling uh, tomatoes or bananas. I'm selling a service. and I'm selling our skill. And yeah. these are people. And there's different types of leadership. We realized that we were investing in a lot of staff and they're leaving us because they're getting so valuable. Yeah. The older staff stay because they have this sense of loyalty, loyalty and yeah. they've built this company with me mm. to a certain point and they're stable. So what we did is we invested in looking at leadership programs, looking mm. at mentors, you know, uh, reading mentors. books. Are you with me, right? Identifying what the best people around the world are doing, learning from those case studies, yeah. having those sessions. We actually have a lot of heart-to-heart -heart sessions. So we are transparent enough to, to have an open, constructive discussion about where our shortfalls are. And yeah. I think that's very important. Mm. And when you identify that, then you can come up with solutions. So you say, all right, we need to capacitate ourselves mm. by getting a mentor in or getting a leadership training in or getting entrepreneurship training in. Yeah. And, and that is what we then invested mm. in to equip ourselves in how to deal with people, mm. how to handle difficult situations or to handle difficult people. Yeah. And then we started realizing that, look, we need specialists. Let's mm. get an HR person. Yeah. Let's get a finance person. Yeah. You know, let's get a tender to person deal with the... to deal with them because yeah. these are specialists mm. in the field. And as we started developing, we realized that we're not a small company anymore. We need to act like a corporate. Yeah. We need to act professional. So let's get the professional people in, invest in them, and they will look after your business. And that's what I've done. That's what you've done over the years. Over the years. Amazing, because this is exactly what I was going to ask you, because I think this is exactly where we mostly lack as entrepreneurs. But, you know, I want us to take a little bit of a break um, and then we can get back and continue with this amazing conversation. Guys, we'll be right back. Thanks. We are back, guys, as we are continuing our conversation with Mohamed. Um, on his professional journey, Mohammed, thank you so much again for, for being here with us and creating the time. I would like us to now talk about how you diversified into Africa, you know, um, how, in which country did you start diversifying into? This is obviously from South Africa and, and, and you've already spoken about the challenges of running a, a business as a foreigner in, in, in South Africa, but I think it's in every African country, actually. You, they all always protect their own first, which is, which is normal. But now, can, you, can, can we talk about how you diversified into other African countries and which country did you start first? So the first country is obviously home. Oh, you started with right? what? So yeah. Botswana, <laughs> right? So I, it, was, it was probably the easiest from a legality point of view, mm. having an Omang and, you know, having a citizenship, etc. So it made it a bit easier. So I was able to register the company, 
get myself established, but I wasn't able to get business in. So I try to partner with a few friends that I went to high school with yeah. and try to say, look, um, I have this service offerings, try and see if you can get me in. But the Botswana market wasn't playing ball. Mm -hmm. I approached Botswana Bureau of Standards. I approached as many people as possible. You but knocked the doors. I knocked the doors yeah. and they weren't that. So I just said, you know what, I'll leave this company uh, open for this matter and um, uh, I'll come back to it. Yeah, you just like... Uh... Let but, it what rest. I, correct. Yeah. but what I did was I invested in getting the accreditation, mm. BQA, HRDC. All, all I the said, accreditation I said, you know what, yeah. might as well just do all of that. So mm. I decided let's get all the accreditation. So mm. we got that in and um, it wasn't bringing revenue. So obviously once uh, bitten, twice shy. Then I said, you know what, I am going to Australia and I'm going to Australia on behalf of this client of ours called Goldfields Mining Operations. Mm. And there's a lot of, then the Goldfields guys were saying, Mohammed, this is unique what you're doing. You not only come and audit us and tell us what's wrong, but you help fix it and then you help defend against excellent auditors. Yeah. Nobody's doing this, not in, not in Perth, Australia, and nobody's doing it with the work ethics that your team comes in and doing it. Yeah. So I said, okay, fine, um, let's look at opening up an office here. So I started communicating with our accountants in South Africa and I said, do you guys have a branch or a partner or someone in Australia? And they mm. said, yes, we do. So they linked me up with him and they said, this is the process to open up a business. Mm. But unfortunately, you have to partner up with a citizen. And that citizen is from that accounting firm. So I said, not a problem. Sure. Uh, I'm in, willing in to. Ozi. In Australia. Oh, so you started off in Aussie. Yes. Okay, so I started you. off in Australia and I said, okay, fine. Let's go ahead and do this. Mm. So I set up the company in Australia, got everything ready. Now I'm ready to deploy a couple of my resources across into Australia. Australia and bang COVID-19 hit mm. yeah so now with COVID-19 coming well, what into year play, was this when you're setting up this was about 2018, 2018. 2019 so 2018 yeah. I all of that was all getting set up by the end of 2019 we are ready now mm. to actually send uh you know the the staff over through to Australia yes so we've now got the visas, uh, we've got everything. We've got an office in Australia. Mm. We've got uh, some one or two locals that we've partnered with there that are based there and COVID-19 hit. Mm. But fortunately, we're able to generate clients. And the, the, way, the way it happened was because of word of mouth. So mm. Post-COVID? Post Post-COVID. Post -COVID. Yeah, yeah. So word of mouth allowed us to get into the health insurance fund, yeah. uh, go, go into a few of the manufacturing companies. So through COVID-19, because we were so cheap, we were charging the same amount of uh, uh, daily rates in South Africa, uh, uh, the same rate uh, as what we were charging in Australia. And remember, yeah. Australian dollars is like... 10 times the amount of what South African Rand is. Yeah. So they looked at the numbers and they were like, this is very cheap. So this is definitely worthwhile considering. Yeah. So they they took a leap of faith and they were working with us remotely. Mm. And it worked to our benefit because it was COVID-19 and you could not obviously go anywhere, go anywhere and mm. intact, etc. So they did work with us remotely. Mm. We were able to generate some revenue and get some work being done there. And whilst this was happening, we realized we were unable to go to Ghana. We were unable to go to Peru. Mm. So now it's now a, a decision where do you lose those big contracts mm. because you are unable to service them face to face um, and the visas and all the vaccines and there's becoming a hu huge issue. So I decided to take the leap of faith to say, OK, now with this accounting firm, do you have an office in Ghana? Do you have an office in Peru? Mm. And they said, yes, we do. And then now started getting mm. them no, to much. work and mm. build that relationship. Now I've, I've done it once. I can do it the second time with Ghana. And with Ghana, fortunately, uh, with the people that I've had strong relationships with, they were giving me resources that I needed to consider yeah. to be able to help me. So I started employing people in Ghana. I started employing people in Peru. So I now got a, a visualization of what the market is outside of South Africa. And uh, although not everyone was based in the country, they would be coming here for training. They would be going back. You know, they would uh, come here. They'd be seconded there. We yeah, so it would be the team here working correct, there. Yeah, working there. Now, yeah. And then we'd be sending them across to all the places. And mm -hmm. then uh, in Ghana, we established uh, uh, the resource based full time in Ghana. And she started developing the Ghana team. And now we're now looking at expanding in Ghana. Yeah. Where now she's going to be recruiting more people. And now obviously the sales, yeah. et cetera. But I think the key thing in setting up in these things, it's having a, a good accounting firm. Mm. We were to partner with. To partner yeah. with. So we were, we, we were smart enough to work with a company, an accounting firm that was small, but then got bought out by an international company. Mm. And they had leveraged through the world. So we worked with them 
to make sure from a legal point of view we had all the tax and uh, the registration and everything done correctly yeah. which allowed you to work with the right people you paid a little bit extra but you knew things would get done yeah. so at least the company registration documents and bankings everything, and yeah. everything was sorted mm, administration so back, that that is very important yeah I think back yeah. office things back office things yeah once that happens it's all about knowing how to scale mm. so how do you scale so scaling is all about where the world is today it's yeah. all about digital marketing that's where the world is digital marketing. so it's about google adwords it's about uh, writing the right articles it's about facebook it's about tiktok it's mm. about linkedin it's about instagram mm. that's where people are going to know because that's where they are on, they're on their devices most of the time mm. and they need to see who you are through your device so we realize that through your website if you create subdomains in australia if you create a subdomain in Ghana, mm. a subdomain in Botswana, in Peru, and you create a social media platform that drives traffic to these areas, and with the credibility that we have, we would be able to get good business. So we in hide that, in, in those, that area, areas. those areas, yeah. And and we don't have to call the clients; the clients will call us. Mm. And that is something that we started doing. We started investing heavily in digital marketing, mm. in trying to establish a brand, and then we started realizing that. You know what? We actually need people to answer the phone calls and respond and being local. Yeah. Then we partnered with a company in Australia that does that. So they do business development. Mm. So they will you pay them a, a set a, a fee on a retainer, and they have targets that uh, are, they have to meet yeah. for those retainers, and they get a commission out of every deal that they yes. bring in. Yeah. And what I needed to understand is, being as an entrepreneur, you can't do everything yourself. You need to share responsibility. You need to share the particular opportunity in order to grow. Yeah. You know, and I think Jeff Bezos once said that, you know, um, although he's a very wealthy person, he only owns like 26% shares or something like that on Amazon. Mm. So he said he created 74% shares or wealth for the other people around the world to invest in. Yeah. And I think that's... Are these a, employees or... The other people around the world. Around the world. Stakeholders, anyone, shareholders, anyone yeah, wants to invest. So that they feel like they're part of it. Part of it. Yeah, not feel like it. they are a part of Correct. it. Correct. So, and I think so that's is that very what important. you did? So in a way, that's what I started doing. So I said, in a smaller scale, I said, you know what? You need to realize that you're not going to be able to make all the money yourself. Mm. Are you with me? You want to, but you need to be able to share that in order to get bigger. More money. Correct. Mm. So that's when now I started sharing responsibility with other companies and partnering with them. Mm. In Botswana, we partnered with two or three companies. Mm. In in in, uh, in Australia, we partnered with one big organization. Mm. In Ghana, we are now busy partnering with two organizations. In Peru, with one organization. Just to get the job done. Just to get the job done. They have the networks. They are established in the country. They love what we do. Yeah. They can't do what we do. Yeah. So they see an opportunity to upscale their businesses using us. And we're coming in at an affordable rate. Because for them. For them. Yeah. So they see it as a win-win situation. Yeah. So we are now establishing our, our business. And then what we did is we said, okay, how do we get more? Because training is difficult. Mm. So I decided to invest in a learning management system. So I created all the content into cartoons, into animation. Yeah. And I got them accredited and I put them on an LMS. Mm. And I started selling them online. Now people, the one man, or the I don't, I don't need to fill a class of of five people because I'm not going to make profit. Yeah. Now I can get to the one person that wants to do the course at their own time, but do it fun, you know, online, online, mm. and the luxury and see it being gamification. Like with one of the courses we have is twelve runs or with Muhammad Ali. Yeah. So you know we make it fun. Amazing. You know, and I think that and and, and, and you are you are animated in it. Yes, I'm, also, the... <laughs> I'm one of the animators, I'm one of the voiceovers, but mm. we've got different characters, different mascots, yeah. different everything. So that allowed me to say, okay, let me push that first because mm. that's a low-hanging fruit. Yeah. And then they will know, okay, this is what they can do. And they'll go now into the consulting route and get the avenues. And yeah. I think that's how we were able to scale. Yeah, so the people can just pay online. Correct. Basically, I can learn the cost through online. here. You, you diversify it. Instead of having to go, um, you guys having to come to us, we mm. can just access you here is Correct. that what you're saying you've exactly. diversified your learning systems amazing Correct. this is actually quite interesting and i want us to now um that's how you diversified into all the countries yes. and then now bringing it back to to, to side but the head office is still in south africa yes. and you have your team from south africa based in all these areas, but you also have do you have locals yes. employed there yes, as well also, yes. employed over there so how is business Business hasn't been too bad, you know. Um, I think with us, it's it's always scary to scale mm. and to build sustainability. 
you must remember that every time the structures of organizations change, mm. you are at risk. Yeah. Because um, they don't know you, the new mm. people, and they yeah. trust uh, the people they have worked with in the past. Yes. So it's always being able to showcase your ability and making them feel that you are, are adding value. Yeah. And I think that is the most important part in our business. So it's always very scary. Look, we are doing well. Mm. We are scaling. We are growing. We've now looked at, you know, venturing into different service offerings like software development, mm. uh, like even having a studio and doing animation and induction videos. Yeah. Are you with me, right? Yeah. We've scaled our business into different areas to get more of a service catalog. Mm. So that's okay. But we always, I always like to say, keep yourself on your toes, keep yourself grounded because there may be a time again mm. where you might be required to downsize. Yeah. But fortunately, for with God's mercy, we are doing well as a business. Yeah, so far, so good. So business is good. Is this is all the branches? All yes. the branches across the world? All the branches across the world. So, so Mohamed, now, I, I would like to, you know, get an understanding of your schedule. I, you have all these branches. How are you managing your schedule? Yeah. You have two boys, a baby coming. You have a wife. You have a family. How are you balancing this? So it's difficult. I'll just give you an idea. So I'll show the camera. This is my <laughs> calendar, right? So that's how my it's, calendar... Is that March looks That's how, just March. What's right? you there somewhere yes, as well? 100%. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. So that's how my calendar looks. And I think it's about having yeah. a, a good time management skills. Mm. So my schedule is hectic. You know, if I have to tell you that I... Uh, like this week, I was actually training... Uh, the Australian team as well as some of our clients so I wake up at around half past two mm, the, the, the time difference the time or oh, you do this online I yeah. this online you know I could be there yeah you know in present but you know due to me traveling a lot I wanted to take a break mm. so uh, so generally I wake up at about half past two start training at three o'clock you know mm. um, then finish at 11. But would you go to the office for this? Or yes, would you, you I do it at home. I can even go to the office. Our offices are 24 by 7. They are running, you know, because there's different people running in different countries and different, different time hours. zones. Amazing. So, so there's a team yes. running for different time zones in South Africa. In this South is, Africa as well. This is efficient. Yes. So you're 24 hours, 24 7. Yeah, is 24 it 24 by 7? 7. 24 by 7. On the weekends, we try and give people the break, but there are people on standby mm. uh, that are able to assist if need be at any given point in time. Yeah, so, for in case your client needs anything. Correct. This is amazing. So now you have, what you're saying, you've managed in the travel by actually now bringing the... Uh, the trainings online. Yes. Has COVID helped with this? Is it the one that yes, you're able to th create? Yes, 100%. To so yeah. I think you needed, I think people when, when COVID came, they saw it as a negative thing. We had to look at it as an opportunity. Mm. Where exactly can we work? So we saw that everyone's going virtual, everyone's doing mm. Teams and Zoom, etc. So we yeah. needed to use that to our advantage. Mm. So we started doing the same thing and we obviously are now looking at bringing costs down. You know, we're looking at bringing travel down yeah. and then clients like to see those things. They like to see money being saved but still getting a service. Yes. So once you can do those things and, and not be too greedy and give them that comfort that you're bringing their costs down and adding value as well, you 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 basically winning them yes, over and building yes. the trust. So that's what we've done. We yeah. use COVID to an opportunity to do things virtually. When need be, we go physically. Having good schedule is all about time management, knowing what is priority and what you need to do and what is not that much of a priority with mm. all due respect and handing it over to the relevant responsible person and delegating it to them yeah. to execute. And slowly, slowly, it's not just a Muhammad Ali business. Mm. You know, there's it's a the person, delegation it's helps. the delegation that helps. That's how you're able to also be able to spend time with your family and just right. create. Is your family in that schedule as well? Yes. You say family time. Yes, <laughs> you block yes. the calendar very, very family important. time. Yes, yes. Do you actually block the calendar for family yes, time? Yes, we do. We try and block a lot of time out for, uh, for whether it's a doctor's uh, session or whether it's mm. just time to get away yeah. or even the schools my wife is very good she'll book my calendar out if there's a school event or there's mm. a sporting event or there's a parents uh, evening yeah. she will block it out you know and, yes. and we will make sure we give the necessary time required to yes. our children does your wife work with you she does. What does she do in the business? She's a lawyer by mm. profession, um, mm. and she started off as an administrator, and now she handles uh, the divisions of HR, legal, and finance. Okay. And a lot of the marketing also goes through to her. Mm. But she does the due diligence on marketing. So she sits at the director level, and she is, she's been with me for 
from the day we started, yeah. you know. So for the last 10 to 11 years, um, um, while she's been involved in the business, she understands the business. She understands my travel schedule. She understands mm-hmm. how I, we, what we need to do to establish. So it's a good synergy. We, we, we always run things by one another. We mm-hmm. might not see them in the same eye, but we're able to constructively come up with a solution that best suits the business. The business yeah. And we're able to disassociate ourselves with the company and our personal time. That's what I wanted to ask her. They're there in the kitchen. You guys are busy. <laughs> you're, you're, maybe you're just, you know, catching up over, over, you know, you don't drink alcohol, so it can be a glass of wine. <laughs> but, you know, over dinner, whatever. Do you, how are you guys able to separate the work from the, that? Like, do you intentionally say we're not talking about work? Like, um, how, how do you manage that? I, I mean, think we, we don't really, ha- it just happens naturally. How is it? It does yeah. happen very naturally. I think uh, when we need to talk about work, we will talk about mm. it. Uh, but we don't talk about it as much, you know. We generally talk about, you know, how we can be able to give the best future to our children yeah. and give them enough time and enough attention that they deserve yeah. and manage our schedules very carefully that we're able to do that yeah. and handle. Actually, she's very good with delegating and t- uh, handle, because she was very hands-on. Mm. Um, at one point, when we were very small as the business, she was doing the legal, she was doing the finance, she was mm. doing the HR. But she was able to, to also, you know, backstep a little bit and get them to learn uh, while she delegated the the skills yeah. and the knowledge to the right people yeah. and move away. I've done the same. But from my side now, it's more expansion. My, vi- my, my vision of where I'm in the business is about expanding and scaling the business in the different yes. countries. That's your focus right That's now. That's my focus. And Everybody's doing that work. Everyone's doing yeah, that work. Yeah, yeah. You, you are just on the... Let, let me grow yes. the business. Correct. Yeah. Let me grow the business. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. So, Mohammed, you know, you and I off camera, we spoke about the importance of partnership. You know, your partner um, in life. You know, this is your life partner. You know, I'm not talking business partner. I'm talking life partner, your wife, your, your husband. The, impo- the, the, the the main role they play and the you know like you're saying synergy the energies that they bring and and how they encourage you and you know into being a successful person or both of you being successful or building a successful business or anything successful let's let's talk about that yeah i think you know you have to choose the right partner yeah um, that's very important. Um, mm. You have to choose the right partner. They have to understand you and you have to understand them. Mm. And it's not easy to understand that before you get married. Yeah. It's a total different thing when you're dating to when you're married. Mm. But you have to have trust. And you have to build yourself on certain values. And I think with Shabana and I, mm. that we've been married now for you know 10 going on to 11 years, um, what's very important is she understands where I want to go and I understand where she wants to Do go. Do share. And we share. You share. You we guys share talk about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about your visions and ways you yeah. support each other. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. She wanted to finish her LLB um, and I allowed her to do so. You know, mm. she uh, uh, sees that I want to grow the business and it's our future. Yeah. And she can also leverage off that business to be able to ensure that the legal fraternity can also mm. expand on. So mm. we kind of have the, the right vision together. But I think what was nice is when we got married, you know, we... We were going to work together. We had our space. Mm. Uh, we were developing the business together. There was a lot of transparency. Mm. She could see the finances. I could see the finances. We were living within our means. Yeah. We weren't living doing within things. your means. We yeah. weren't going extravagant. When we did make a bit of savings, we t- spent time to go away. And my wife has this thing where she makes it very clear: where when you're married, you should not stop dating. Mm. So that means make sure that every Wednesday we used to have this thing. We used to go on a date yeah. every so Wednesday. Remember you, yourselves besides WIs, besides the kids 100%. and everybody. Yeah. And I think that was a very that's a very special moment where you scheduled in your life. So on a Wednesday you look forward to it. Yeah. You're going out for dinner. You're going to watch a movie. You're mm. going to watch a play. So you're spending the time. You're building that bond. And you're getting that relationship going. For me, I think what's important is there have been tough times where I've not been able to make decisions and I'm able to talk to my partner about it. And she guides me with regards to her own intuition. And what's nice, I never hold her accountable for decisions that may have not gone our way. And she does the same. We don't throw people under the bus. Mm. I got your advice. I make the decision after listening to your advice. But the advice has been great. So I'm able to to, to leverage that on her. and And we're both young. 
and we're both talking to one another and trying to figure out the best solution. And not always will we get it right, mm. but we feel that uh, we do the best we can. Yeah. We're a very strong knit couple. We try and do the best we can for our family, for our extended families. Mm. And when there's time needed to get away, we get away. Yeah. And just, we spend just the, the family. Time. Just the family, yeah. just the kids. And even at certain times, just the, we, two, of just the two of us. Yeah. And we Most go sometimes, yeah. uh, yes, and it's so important yeah. to do that because you reconnect, you rekindle, yeah. you bring that moment of understanding why you love each other, yeah. of why you went into this journey, and yeah. you appreciate one another. Yeah. And then when you come back, you come rejuvenated, remotivated to be able to conquer the world. Absolutely. And I think that's yeah. what a partner is required. So, what you're saying is don't forget yourselves, you know, Very don't forget important. yourselves. And, and I like the f fact that you also mentioned uh, tapping into your intuition. I think there's another thing, um, a lot of males I, I would say that especially male leaders or even males in, in in as leaders in the homes on the importance of tapping into your your wife's intuition you know for me i think that that's such wisdom that you you know that what she would know compared yeah. to what, what do you think she, you know? she 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 has an intuition of being able to judge people better than i am yeah and women have that. And yeah. you need to acknowledge, you You cannot be a chauvinist person. You cannot be a sexist person. Yeah. You need to understand their strengths that a woman has. I have a mother. Mm. I have a sister yes. who brought me up. And they had these intuitions. And it allowed me to see that and evolve. And I was like, wow. Yeah. So if you allow your partner to express that and and allow yourself to take a back seat, you will grow together. Yeah. And I think that's very important that you uh, you listen to her opinions, you give her a platform to express herself, and you work together and support one another. Even if it doesn't go yeah. her way or my way, yeah. we're there. And I think that's so important that you give your partner the pivotal point. And I think we don't give enough um, opportunity to women nowadays. You'll yeah. see most of our company, I think it's about 70% a woman. Ah. And Was that deliberate? To a, yes, to a yeah. point. And the reason is that they are, uh, you know, they take, they take, a lot of pride in their work mm. when it comes to admin work they take a lot of pride yeah they're quite disciplined and i've realized that women are very good in multitasking as opposed yeah. to yeah men get very frustrated very quickly they like to be hands-on they don't they get bored very quickly yeah. women have a, a a way of being disciplined for a longer period of time and if you have the right people around you and the right advice around you trust me you will be able to get more. yeah no absolutely what motivates you um, to be honest with you, in different stages of my life, different things motivated mm. me. You know, I think the when I was growing up, uh, I always wanted to be a sports person. You have yeah. an idol, you have a sports person, mm. John T. Rhodes, Cristiano Ronaldo, mm. you want to aspire to be them. Do you love football as well? I love football. Which version is your favorite team? Unfortunately, it's Manchester United. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, but it was doing very well when I was and growing up. Oh, well, uh, my, my husband is also a menu. I don't think he gets it doing too well. Yes, 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 yes. So growing up, it was mostly around sport, and then as I started evolving, my dad become an insp my dad becomes an inspiration. Mm. My mum becomes an inspiration mm. in, in terms of our entrepreneurial. Are they also supporting. entrepreneurial? They are. Yeah, entrepreneurs, yes. just entrepreneurs. So both yeah. of them are. So I mm. got them to be my role models, and then. As you get into the business and you start having children, mm. your whole life changes yep. and they are my motivation. Mm. I wake up in the morning knowing that I want to, they look at me as Superman. You know? So they look at me as someone that can play sport with them, mm. give them the time, take them for their sport, uh, give them the ear when they need it to be given. And I'm still working and doing all of this. And provide for them. And provide for them. And mm. I think that wake, every morning I wake up knowing that I want them to be inspired by me, yeah. like how I was inspired by my parents. Yeah. So that for me motivates me the most. Yeah. It's that I want them to feel that, you know, the world is out there. Go ahead, grab it. There'll be a lot of difficult times. But yeah. Trust me, you can be able to. You're gonna, you're gonna be able to make it. What is your greatest fear? Do you have a fear? What is um, your greatest fear? You know, I think um, the greatest fear when you're starting off is always mm. disappointing someone. I never wanted to disappoint my parents. I yeah. never wanted to disappoint my family. You know, that was the biggest fear, yeah. you know. And now I think the biggest fear is, it's, it's weird. It's, although it's how, far, how quick or how far I can grow, it's also the fear of how, how the further you go up, the longer it will take to get down and be more painful, mm. you know. 
So I think that is basically the fear. In terms of growth, when you're growing as a business, um, you're worried about all the different people that mm. you have to look after. Yeah. Because it's not just you and your family now. It's the, team. it's the entire team. And their families. Their families. <laughs> yep. And yeah. in South Africa, they have something called black tax. Are you with me, right? <laughs> yes, yes. You know? yes. No, no. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I think black tax is in every family, <laughs> yeah. actually, to be honest. Yes, <laughs> but yes, so. but I hear you. So yeah. I think that's the biggest fear. So I think for me, I want to make sure that I have a clear conscience to be able to ensure that I make the right decisions. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the only fear I have is 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 falling down. Yeah. Uh, oh, shame. What what has been your most satisfying moment in business? I think there's been uh, two. Uh, one, obviously, um, taking MTN through mm. unique certification yeah. uh, in a very short space of time, and the second, taking the goldfields mining operations through certification for being the first mining house in the world. Mm. Those are the two career highlights, I would say. Yeah. But personally, the biggest achievement and the biggest highlight in my life has been choosing the right partner. Ah. Oh. By far. This is amazing. Oh, this By is far. actually quite heartwarming. I hope she watches this and sees yeah. this. How, how much you mean, how much she means to you. She does. Yeah. She yeah. Um, what is your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur? I think it's the, the different challenges that come with it mm. um, and the different people you meet. Mm. I've met some wonderful people yeah. along the way mm. and however young, however old. But I think uh, the networking, yeah. the, the, the discussions with them and the growth, you know, I think it's just been amazing to see yeah. where you started something small and how it's been evolving. And when your employees come and say, thank you so much, Mohammed, for the opportunity. My child was able to graduate and uh, thanks to you. That for me is more heartwarming than anything yeah. else. My brother says the same thing. He's also running his own consulting business. One of the, 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 the questions I asked him is what has been your greatest highlights and in, in your in greatest gratifying moments in businesses like being able to take care of other people's families. Very important. I agree with you. You know, he says like there's nothing as heartwarming as knowing Very these true. people are dependent on me for their families, you know? So it's, it's most heartwarming for you, I guess, as well. Um, you know, there are some, you know, engineers watching this, uh, you know, also college graduates, you know, university graduate engineers watching this. What would piece of advice would you give them right now? I think uh, something that I learned is uh, don't run after money. Mm. Are you with me, right? Yeah. Run after the opportunity where you feel you can grow the most, yeah. um, where you can express your um, abilities and skills. Yeah. Whatever it may be, graduate programs, mm. a small organization, anything. And if you don't get an opportunity to get a job, yeah. try and harness your entrepreneurial skills, mm. do things online to be able to uh, survive. And I don't think you need to depend on the fact that I have a certain lifestyle that I want to leave to. It will come with time. It will come, Be yeah. patient. Be patient. That's the, that's the that's thing. They, they don't look at things in Instagram and believe that they are. 100%. There is no instant uh, success. There is no. no instant success. You it have to follow work. a process. You have to follow a process. Be patient. Give it time. It will come. Yeah. This is what your, your, your message here um, for, for the for, for the for the youth or whoever is is feeling frustrated at the moment, um, are you a reader? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, what I am. what are you currently reading right now? So right now it's how to speak like a CEO, mm. Susan Bates. Yeah, you know. So I think, like I mentioned earlier, it's all about your ability to communicate yeah. and motivate your staff mm. and also communicate with your clients and your suppliers to get the best out of them. Yeah. So I'm doing that. Um, I think the best book I've ever read that gave me inspiration was in university. I, I was asked by a professor to read this book called Quality, Excellence and Performance mm. by James R. Evans. It was mm. the seventh edition. Mm. That book has case studies of large organizations, CEOs, COOs of all the failures mm. that they came across, every single failure and how they persevered through those failures to become a success. Yeah. For me, that was extremely gratifying because you are dealing with facts, yeah. people's true lives of what they went through in large organizations yeah. and how they were sick. For me, brilliant book. So when did you read that one? This uh, was in probably around 2014. 
Ah, so this is when you, okay, because I was trying to check that this is the, the, basically the one that even helped you when, yes. when, when contracts were being withdrawn, when Correct. things, you know, and you're like, <laughs> yeah, you're just 100%. like, yeah, no, this will be a part of it. Um, I think um, the very last question, um, what is the part of your life experience you would alter if you had a chance to? To be honest with you, there wouldn't be much. I think I'm very fortunate. When I was in school, mm. uh, a lot of people don't do this. When I was in primary school, as you would know, yeah. you need to to allow yourself an opportunity to do everything. Yeah. So I, even if I wasn't good in something, I would try and do it. Mm. I would, uh, whether it was sport, whether it was in academics, whether yeah. it was service, you have to try yeah. and attempt in everything. And that's what I did in, in primary school, in high school, and in my working mm. world. And with that being said, there's not much that I'd like to alter. If you had to alter anything, I would probably say I would have loved to get made much more younger to the girl of Oh, really? Yes. Oh, shame. You're like, shame, I wish I, I made you earlier. Yes. But but I'm sure timing is everything. You Correct. know how God works, yes. how Allah works. Um, he always um, aligns everything oh, according yes. to uh, the timing. But amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you Pleasure. have any last parting words for, for our viewers, but... Um, you know, it's something that I learned when I was small. Mm. So I'm going to part with this and I extend it to it. So um, each individual, when you are choosing a career, choose wisely. Mm. Don't run after money. All right. Look at where the opportunities are in terms of the shortage of skills mm. um, around the world and choose that career based on that. Yeah. And when you go into it, these are certain attributes that I recommend you for having. Yeah. Firstly, it's about being disciplined. Yeah. And that talks about being patient and taking your time. Yeah. You've got to have the hunger to be determined to make sure you finish. Yeah. Even though there's going to be failures and obstacles in your way. Mm. And then you've got to be dedicated. You've got to wake up in the morning. You've got to be able to make sure that there's going to be tough times. You've got to put in the long hours. You've got to know that there's nothing that comes for free. Those, those are the three. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to be determined. You've got to be dedicated. Then as you grow as a person, you need to start communicating. You need to express yourself. You need to communicate with the, the networks you have. People don't know what you do. People don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. So you need to voice that. If you're an introvert, do it online. If you're an extrovert, also do it online. Yeah. Go, go on go digital. digital. You've been digital. saying digital Speak. is working. It's yeah. working. You need to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is, out of every single element, I think it's about being able to self-motivate yourself mm. and also when you leave a conversation, motivate the next person. Yeah. So when you leave a mark behind, you will never be forgotten. Yes. Always leave whoever that you're dealing with better than the way that they were. Yeah. You said it even better. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what you were saying. Yes. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for, this, for doing this with us. We are so appreciative. Yes, I hope we've learned so much from this conversation. I have learned a lot from this conversation. And thank you so much for making time. You're a busy man. We are very, very appreciative. Thank you, guys. Bye for now.